We have come to the end of our journey, and that is to answer the age-old question. Did whoever really smelt it, were they the one who really dealt it? We do have a culprit that always ruins movie night. When we have guests over, it's quite embarrassing because everybody looks at the humans first. We all know it wasn't any of us. This was a really fun project. How do we hide the device? You know, should we have it in plain sight, like a big old meter that we carry around? Or do we hide it in something kind of like ordinary every day? So to start, well, it's surgery time. And for that, I needed to perform a stuffectomy. Yeah, we needed to kind of hollow him out. And so looking at him, I wanted to do this the most natural way possible. And that's to use just the existing seam lines. And I figured if I can tear at those and just remove the threads, well, I'd be able to put it back together again, concealed and no one would be the wiser. And holy grail of stuffing. Now I understand this is kind of disturbing because watching it now, I'm like, Kind of reminds me a little bit of the, you know, it puts the lotion in the basket a little bit. So, you know, a little, little freaky there. And now to try and figure out how to build something, we almost have to build this skeleton for it, like this endoskeleton. And I had no idea how I was going to start this. So I figured I'd start with the head and just kind of built as I go. Like everything here, we very rarely start or stop with any plans. First thing I have to do is figure out how to mount this servo. I took a piece of scrap wood and started cutting out like a square for it. This, this is looking a little mangled here, but you know, let's see if I can clean this up a little bit. Doesn't matter too much, no one's gonna see it, but I know, you know, I'll see it. This is the part where I hope there's like no woodworkers watching because they're just like, I can't unsee it. Am I hammering like right down on the servo and nails? Oh my gosh. What I was thinking for the nose and attaching the nose portion, which is a popsicle stick to the servo and then having it go back and forth. And now I have to figure out this eyeball situation taking just scrap pieces of wood and cutting them down. I'm sticking like, I guess what's called ears, but think of it more of like eye attachments. Looks kind of like a droid or something right now. Is that a tail? That's another culprit that I caught uh, making some stinkies. For the actual eye sockets, I decided to use PVC pipe. I did minimal measuring. I just kind of like held the thing up and just said, okay, the eyes kind of go over here. This entire project was a big guessing game. Next, what well, kind of needs a body. Oh, I had to chop its head off first. I forgot about that. Because if you look at Fartatukis here, he's actually angled. And that was the toughest part. And here I am trying to get the angle mostly right. You know, I wasn't going for perfection here. After all, this is a fur detector. You know, we're not building anything going to the, to the moon. Sometimes there's just no good way of clamping these things down. And so a lot of holding things with the fingers and waiting for it to at least tacky up enough. guys caught the length of that screw. Doesn't it look like it would kind of hit the servo? I actually took the whole servo off to see if it crushed through the casing. At the bottom of the casing, there was like a tiny dimple. So I missed it by this much. So this poor servo got hammered. It almost got a screw up its derriere. It just really loved this mission. And now we needed to figure out this tail situation because I thought it would be clever to put the sensor here on the end of the tail. And I wanted a tail that would like extend out so you wouldn't have to like get right up to your subject. 
I started cutting up my popsicle sticks. These are about six inches in length, but I figured six inches would make for a really fat tail and I wanted the tail to look somewhat natural. And so I thought cutting them in half would still give me enough scissor action, enough travel, so I wouldn't have to like hook a whole bunch of them together. I decided to use eyelets. I could have screwed them together and you would have gotten that motion, but I thought we still need to run wires to the sensor. And I wasn't quite sure how I was gonna handle this. I don't want the wires to get pinched. So one idea I had was actually running the wires through these eyelets. When putting them together, I only flared the other end very slightly because if you flare it too much, then it almost like grabs onto the wood and it gives you a lot of friction. So the longer you make that tail, the tougher it is to extend because one idea I had was to somehow automate this extension. I decided to keep this manually operated for now. This would be a cool way when the tail is completely crunched in to have kind of a natural taper. Also, I thought it would be a nice transition for when the tail extended, it would have that nice point. Now comes the sensor wiring, which is at the very end of this tail. This is an MQ-135 sensor. So why did I go for the 135, which is an air quality sensor? Well, I did a little bit of a flatuous research. 99% of, you know, what comes out doesn't even smell. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and methane. I didn't go with the methane sensor because one of the things that I also found out is that not everybody expels methane. You might, you know, not catch a, a tiny percentage. The remaining 1% is what gives it its smell. The majority of it comes from volatile sulfur compounds. An MQ-135 sensor uh, registers the following. Ammonia, nitrogen oxides, alcohol, benzene, smoke, carbon dioxide, and other natural gases. And I even pulled up on certain data sheets that it does detect some sulfides. I thought that the MQ-135 would be the best bet you might just lose one half of a face when it melts off and then you know you can at least have the Phantom of the Opera uh, look going. I started by gluing the sensor to the end of the tail. The tail's kind of fragile and it can't hold a ton of weight. So far it hasn't popped off and you know this thing has been put to use. I left the pin ends on the sensor and I cut off the other ends and instead I ran just a regular hookup wire through the holes and anytime I use hookup wire, I try to wire it with similar colors, if not the same. Months later, you kind of can match up and remember what the heck it is you did. And then on the other side of the wiring, I am connecting up the other sides of the pins because these are gonna have to hook up into the Arduino. I didn't forget the heat shrink this time, guys. Not like the last time where I forgot it for every connection. Thank God you guys were, were on the stream kind of helping to remind me like, heat shrink, heat shrink. We got the tail hooked up. I believe now, well, you know, it needs eyes. For two eyes, we're gonna need two green, two yellow, and two red ones to indicate three levels of uh, fartdom, <laughs> I guess. At the end, you see that I have a signal or power line coming out of each one, and I basically bundled up all the grounds into a single connection. Sometimes I'll start with more grounds and then I'll start to combine them as I start to run out. Once the tail was wired up, the eyeballs are wired up. This is what his skeleton ended up looking like. It looks like a penguin. This does not look like a teddy bear or a bison or anything like that. But you can see all of the red wiring coming from the LEDs hooking up into their proper pins on the Arduino. I used hot glue to kind of 
organize things as best as I can because this is going to go underneath the fur. I hooked up a switch for the servo and here is all of the wiring done for the tail and my little lever arm there that's used to move the tail up and down. We got to put the endoskeleton into the skin. Oh, that sounds awful. That's, that's another, it puts the lotion in the basket moment. And this probably was the most cringy part of doing this because I was so afraid of snapping that nose off. Then the whole thing would have to come apart again. And here I'm regretting my decision of not cutting that slit in the back further up. I didn't want to damage the fur. I thought it looked so nice. And if I cut it, it might start fraying, you know, kind of like a sweater. You start pulling the string and the whole thing falls apart. So instead I just summoned my patience. So I wanted to do something with the eyes that looked like they were there all along, like a toy that you would buy off of a, you know, Toys R Us shelf, you know, if they, if they were still here. So the idea I had was maybe buying glass eyes. And I thought, you know, one inch, it's a little big. It's, it's a little creepishly big for the size of this, especially given his original eyes were like this big. I wanted something big enough so the LEDs would shine through. And I didn't want to put them just clear like this because what if you could see the LEDs through them and you would still have that cheap Halloween effect. So I decided I'm going to try and paint them like, you know, doll eyes. And I have never done this. Goats, bison, you know, animals from, from that mammalian family all have those oval type eyes. So I was going to copy that here. And when I started, I had instant regrets. Look how bad that looks. It looks all jaggedy and it's all see-through. But I saw that the more layers that I started adding or the more coats, it started to even out. I started to lose a lot of those jagged edges. And then of course, as happens with me, I start to get really brave. And this is where I start to use a lot of paint. So a lot of the jaggedy edges are gone. And now I know that I'm going to glue the eyes around the perimeter. And I thought it's going to look really cheap if like there's a whole bunch of hot glue around the eyeballs and they're going to look really bad. So I need a way to conceal them. So I thought about darkening the outer perimeter that would hide the glue line. And so using a flat brush and just dry brushing, I'd start from the outer edge and just push that paint towards the inside. So it started to create these cool natural striations. And I was like, well, how fortuitous. And at this point, I thought I was done. This is going to look really super cool. But then I thought, would you still be able to see the LEDs? And would it glow like way too bright? Maybe I should paint it a color, but translucently, you know, so that way my LEDs could shine through. Well, every color I thought of was going to clash. So I decided to go with a metallic. And the advantage of a metallic is that it's actually pretty translucent itself. The pigmentation is not as plentiful. We have our eyes and now we have to actually get them on him. I want to be real careful not to get glue and just mangle up all that fur area. So I took my skinniest little nozzle and slowly just added dabs of glue and held the fur in place. So that way it would be stuck to just outside of that PVC pipe. That way I can glue the eyes on the PVC versus gluing it on the, the fur. And what I found is that three quarter inch PVC, the outer diameter is pretty close to one inch. So I'm like, okay, this is all working out for someone who had, did no measurements and just started putting this together with pretty much no plans. This is what he looked like when all the gluing was done. Very Halloween creepy. <laughs> Imagine those lights coming on. So here I'm putting the glue on the outside of the PVC, just that outer surface to be able to glue the eye on. Hey, you can't really see any glue lines. And I am super surprised that I didn't get glue all over his fur. It's always a tough part when you're pulling the gun away. It always leaves that string. Is that eye crooked? Oh, I think that eye is kind of crooked. But you know what? I am not going to fault him because if you're about to smell farts all day, listen, I'd be like cross-eyed too. You guys want to have a little fun? What, what he's made of sensors they do need to warm up for like two three minutes that wasn't me stop it guys that, that that was not me that is actually the sensor firing up even though it's, it's located here i swear i swear it's not me 
snap me. Anytime you turn on a sensor, it starts really high. It's like, holy crap. And then it, the numbers start to move down, down, down into our scales that we created. And now it's in the yellow. Eventually it'll get to the green and it'll chill out. Let's see if we can set it off. I'm gonna put some carbon dioxide on it and see what happens. All right, so my carbon dioxide gets it going like to the yellow. Oh, I got it to the red. And the other thing I have on hand is rubbing alcohol. And you know, you can use the real thing too, you know, test and uh, test and party at the same time. So I'm just gonna take this and um, squeeze the bottle and just waft some of that vapor. See, that's really sensitive to that. Immediately that thing starts going. It was actually my four-legged little furry friend, Eeyore, my little shop helper here. So finally, I found out that the one who smelt it was indeed not the one who dealt it, like not at all. So I was happy to be able to clear my name. These two, they've been watching the whole time. So don't be laughing, you know, because you could be.